Oh, okay. So yeah, we ran a pretty good event. Um, the first place for Gotech was uh, Neil, who is not associated with Gotech. So I don't know if you should clap. He was associated. But second, third, and fourth came were struggling, Cybermedic and Bugs Budgie. So good job if you're here. Anyone? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so congratulations to everyone who participated. Uh good job. And now we're gonna start with Amar who did ML logistics. Yeah, so machine learning challenges are a bit weird in terms of CTFs. They don't really get a whole lot of uh a whole lot of showing. How many of you actually did logistics? How many of y'all are intelligence? Okay. Yeah. Okay, one person in intelligence. Um, so this challenge was a challenge on log logistic regression. Um, we see that from the challenge, we are able to query the model uh, and we can guess the parameters of the model. Querying takes in 100 floats and returns a probability. Uh, guessing takes in 100 plus one floats, or more accurately, one plus 100. It checks if they match the parameters of the model, and if they do, it gives you the flag. How many of y'all are familiar with logistic regression? Uh, I assume not, okay. One guy. Okay, um, logistic regression is a very simple uh, model for deriving a probability based on a couple of input features. So it takes in a vector of input features, let's call it X, and it predicts a probability Y from that. So Y is within zero to one, and then X is just a vector in Rn. It has N plus one parameters, and it works similarly to linear regression. Specifically, what it does is it takes a linear function on the input vector, so it does some constant times the first plus some constant times the second, and so on, sums them all, adds a constant, and to convert that to a probability, it passes it through the special function, which we call xbit. Uh, xbit is, of course, the inverse of log it, and it's defined as, as follows. Um, we can rewrite this, moving everything to the left-hand side and converting everything to vector notation. Uh, we get that predicts the log at function of y as the dot product between the, the vector beta and one concatenated with the feature vectors. We concatenate a one um, to account for the constant term. Um, yeah, so any questions on how logistic regression works? Okay. Um, so the, the attack idea then is since we can query the model, we can query the model a bunch of times, let's say K times, um, we will take the output probability and convert that. We'll undo this whole expert stuff that's going on um, by taking the log it of the output. Uh, we'll call that Z. And then we get a bunch of equations of the form Z is beta dot one, and then a feature vector that we pass for the first one, then that happens for all K queries. Notice that this is a system of linear equations. Um, so we can rewrite this uh, in, in matrix form. We will let X have row vectors one and then a query, and then we just solve for beta and that gets us the flag. Any questions on the attack idea and how the attack works? Yes. No, no. Um, so what I'll do is I will send, in this case, x1 to the model. It will spit something back out, and it'll be of this form. Um, in particular, it'll take the dot product and stuff, and then it'll pass it through xbit. And then I invert that uh, via the logit function to just get whatever this thing inside the parentheses was. Does that make sense? All right. And then from there, I assume you can see how like this turns into a system of linear equations. Good, okay. Okay. Okay, there were some gotchas with the naive implementation. Uh, Logit is numerically unstable. It has an asymptote at zero and one, which means small errors make huge changes in the output. Uh, if you implement this incorrectly, you might get wrong answers. So just use the library implementation. SciPy has one, um, so I just use that. Also, rounding error exists, um, so account for that. I would just use more sample points than needed and then just 
in the linear equation, take the least square solution. If you took math 3406, you cover this. Uh, even if you don't, NumPy has a function that gets you the least square solution. Um, I have a demo, but in the interest of time, what do you think? All right. Um, although my demo is on my laptop. Yeah, it's probably good. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Elliot, Elliot Rowe, in parentheses Elliot, because that was like the author attribution. I'm Gergi414 on Discord. Uh, that was my dog's name, or is my dog's name. He's not dead yet. Um, okay, so I wrote a web challenge named blog. This was my first challenge that I've written. So um, yeah, it will not be as well put together as his presentation. That was very cohesive. Um, yeah. So challenge description. Basically, you're attempting to read George Pete Burdell's secrets. I had to theme my CTF challenge Georgia Tech themed because why not? Uh, but as you enter, once you follow the link that you're given, you're immediately prompted, or you immediately see this list of questions that people post for George Pete Burdell, um, and then a post by George Pete Burdell. No one can ever read my secret smiley face, and then um, a path to a text file that you are assumed to have the flag. So first things first, what I would do at least is simply just follow the URL to see if anything happens. And of course you get a forbidden um, thing here because, you know, why not? So if we go ahead and look at that, oh, I have a question. Cool. Oh, okay, never mind. I got excited. Okay, but if we go ahead and take a look at closer look at the route because the source code was available. I know it was a lot, I'm very sorry. Um, we see that this route only returns two things, an abort or a 404, uh, which basically means that this is a dead end. Uh, I know you're not supposed to put that in CTFs, but here we are. Uh, but you do get one advantage from looking, examining this route and you get confirmation that yes, this does exist. So the fact that we did get a 403 error here uh, means that this file does exist um, on the server and that will be what we're trying to access, but we can't get it through this route. Um, yeah, those are two arrows pointing to both of the outcomes of the if statement. Now, so this brings us back to the question of what input can we manipulate on the website? Do we have guesses, raises hands? No way, yo, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, there's going to be more very general questions. If people want to speak up, help me out. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, so you click the link to new and you get prompted with these two very obvious text box here. So you have title and body. What happens if we um, manipulate these? So we're just going for a test. We get a success screen, post test successfully created, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now let's actually put some interesting stuff in the title and body. Um, of this post immediately. If we post it, we get, boom, an alert, which is uh, what the script does. So we have successfully gotten um, an XSS, or we've ex 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 sorry, successfully found an XSS vulnerability on the website. But this doesn't exactly mean we solve it because this is uh, reflect self-reflective XSS. I actually don't know what it's called, but I'm just gonna call it that. Um, so it means it really only gives us information about us and it doesn't give us the ability to execute anything on the server. So while it does indicate a vulnerability, I think there's something more that we need to look for. So what is SSTI? Anybody going once? Yo, server side template injection. I, <laughs> I took time to like bold the letters to like, see you guys see it. SSTI and then, yeah, yeah, master presenter. Um, but basically <laughs> it's similar to any other injection tag um, like SQL, uh, but you're basically taking user input. It's not 
um, escaped correctly. And then we're using a template framework um, to get arbitrary code execution on our server. If we go ahead, this is an example of what a template should look like in Flask, which is the template framework that we were using for this challenge. Um, as you can see, very normal HTML uh, tags here, except that we have these uh, curly brackets everywhere, which basically allows us to add the dynamic part of um, our template framework here. And a very, very special thing to notice that will come in handy later is this double curly bracket here. So these double curly brackets indicate that we want to actually execute this uh, statement, whatever we want in here. And um, in this case, Flask is a built upon Python. So this would be whatever is inside these double curly brackets here would be executed um, in Python. So now this is an example of a bad template and this can be found within the source code of our uh, of the blog and it's under the route post success. Um, as you can see, I've just made a template from a string and then directly concatenated the request argument uh, type. So as you can see, this was the reason why we did get this XSS because literally I'm, I'm just putting it into the thing. So now, what if we use these double curly brackets to our advantage? Yes. Oh yeah, like this was, I like saw the tutorial and they were like, don't do this. And I was like, I'm gonna do that. Um, so this was a great way to like find potential vulnerabilities for a place is just go on their tutorial. And if they say, don't do this, it's like maybe they forgot to do this. and. Uh, Go ahead and test that. Oh, wait, but yeah, so we put double parentheses and then seven times sevens. So we have guesses what this is going to evaluate to. Forty-nine, post forty-nine has successfully been created. Huh, that's interesting. We put se in seven times seven. So as you can see, oh. I'm so sorry, guys. If you guys are wearing headphones, oh Lord. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we've successfully made the server execute a statement. Now, finding what actually is happening here. So in another piece, when I'm just creating the app, I there is a config environment variable, maybe that's what it's called. Um, but basically, this contains a bunch of attributes attributes of the server. And one of these attributes is secret key, which we have read the flag into. Now, if we go ahead and just put that environment variable into our statement, it will get evaluated on the server. And boom, we get this whole big thing back. And if you guys can see it, it's the wall of text. We have our secret key, which is flag. Yes. Yeah, so are you saying like what would have happened if I did not re read the file into config? Yeah. Double. Oh, this code here. Um, so you, when the code is, this is gonna be a very bad explanation. I'm so sorry about this. But basically when the code is execution, executing, it doesn't have access to the open method, but you can get to it through um, creating a primitive string and then going to the uh, base class of that, which is object. And then you can list all the subclasses of that and navigate your way towards um, a, the, um, I think it's like the file IO class. And then you can create a new file object with that path. And then you do read, and then you, you can read it that way, but this is much easier. Um, but yeah. That's the exploit. That's the challenge. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Oh. Um, I'll stop sharing on here. Um, uh, it's disabled for instant screen sharing. Uh, how do I stop sharing? Um, I stopped it. Uh, and then I'm going to pull it Zoom. Uh, yeah, I'm full screen. So I'm going to pull up Zoom. Where is Zoom? Oh, it's on the other. 
Uh, and then you're on Zoom, you're a mod. Yep. So I'm going to make you a co host. And then you should be able to say, All right. Yeah, but I'm just going to try and move the Zoom call. I don't want to move Zoom. This is so wide. Oh, exit question. There we go. And then somehow we get back into it. I'm just going to move the Zoom call. Oh, so. Oh. Oh, yeah. All right, so here is a demo call that demonstrates how you're supposed to solve the logistics challenge, which is the first one that was presented. I am muted. Oh, wait, no, that's that's my laptop telling me off. It's fine. Um, so what the server does um, is it loads the model from file. It defines a cutoff, which is how close you have to be um, for the model parameters, uh, and then calculates a couple of dimensions to predict what it does is it takes your input array, checks that it has the right size, it has to be 100 floats. We concatenate one to the very start, and then we return x bit of dot of that. Uh, to check, we just take in the parameters the user supplies, checks that's the right shape, check that the delta is um, within the cutoff, and if it is, it's fine, otherwise it's not. I've duplicated this logic in my test file. I didn't do like actually communicating with the server or anything, um, but the same logic is there for a prediction. Again, just check that's the right shape, check it checks it's the right shape and checks what's within the cutoff. My main method, what it does is it takes in, it, it generates 300 vectors. We need 101, strictly speaking, um, for the matrix to be full rank. I did 300 just to have a good margin. What? Oh, okay. Um, I generate a bunch of random numbers. The challenge says that they should be between zero and 50. I don't actually check that, but it's a good guideline. So I just use that. Um, I predict each, on each of those vectors. Um, and we can take a look at what the output of that is. So yeah, this is the data that we sent to the server. Uh, the first vector that we sent was like 20, 45, 26, and so on, so 100 numbers. And then we sent a second one, third one, the 300 rows that we sent. Uh, we got an output of 300, um, 300 different probabilities. We can see that they're all between zero and one. So now we process them by taking the logit of each of them to undo the expert that was done on the server. Uh, and the result of that, you can see that these are just real numbers. For instance, this is minus six, minus two, minus three, and so on. Um, we then calculate what the um, the matrix of the actual inputs after the ones were uh, prepended are. Uh, that's just what this code here is doing. And you can see that we just prepended a one to every vector, every row of the matrix. Uh, we then solve uh, for least squares. We print out the approximation. Here it is. And then we check if it was accepted. Um, any questions on the demo? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Um, yeah, that, that would totally work. Um, the reason that I didn't do, the, my concern is if you just use zeros and ones, I mean, obviously the matrix is going to be full rank. Um, it's the identity matrix, it's obviously invertible. Um, I'm concerned about like, if you get into a situation where the probability is very close to zero or very close to one, you might have precision loss there. The reason that I'm sort of taking it over the entire range, if you take a look at my generation code, um, the way that I generated this, I didn't give any source code for this challenge, by the way. Um, this was my first challenge. Mistakes were made. Um, if you actually did the challenge during the CTF, you would have found that um, the cutoff is actually very strict because printing out the floats loses precision. Um, so yeah, mistakes were made, but they were made. You can't do a whole lot. 
Um, the way that I generate the model is I take a random unit vector for the direction of the weights. Um, so everything but the constant. And then I choose my constant so that uh, it will pass through a point in like sort of the middle of the range that I'm expecting. Uh, and the reason I do that is so that you, uh, I make sure that you don't get the probabilities dropping off too quickly to zero, too quickly to one. Um, it, it's something to think about. All right. Uh, I guess we'll go to the next guy. Do you have a demo? Yeah. Oh. Um, sure screen. Um, okay, I'm going to share a beginner pwn challenge, uh, just called login. This um, should be pretty understandable even if you've never done Pwn before. Uh, so you're attempting to log into to a service and the password you input needs to be the same as a, a secret password that's not provided to you. So you can see that there's a load password um, and then it asks you to input a password and it gets your input and then it compares the two. And if they're equal, it prints out the flag. Otherwise, it just tells you you have the wrong password. However, if we look at how um, the user input and the correct password are laid out in memory, we see that the user input password is actually before the accurate password, um, which is important because gets allows arbitrary read. So you're going to start reading from the beginner password, and then you can keep reading into the accurate, and then you can keep reading into like the correct password. Um, however, there's an issue with this like naive approach where if you do this, you're going to uh, have one of them be like 16 A's and the other one be eight A's. So obviously you can't do that. So what you need to do is you need to have uh, two null bytes, one like 15 A's and then a null byte, and then the other one 15 A's and then a null byte, and then it'll uh, make them both seem equal. So you don't actually need to know what the other password is um because you you can just overwrite it so yeah that was it okay oh hello um i'm daniel i'll go over this challenge and there are some in like the series of three notes challenges um where kind of being able to understand them is slightly prerequisite for solving this, but I think that we can go over those if people want to, um, like afterwards. Um, yeah, can people hear me okay? Oh, okay, cool. Oh, nice. So here's the description of the challenge we get. Um, uh, yeah, we just get a URL and there's a link to a simulated client below it. Um, which is important because that tells us that we're looking for some sort of client side vulnerability, right? Um, we saw in the previous challenge, the previous web that we went over, um, that we had like XSS as a vulnerability, but it didn't matter because there's like nobody to, to trigger that XSS. But in this case, we have a, a simulated client that will visit a web page that you send it. So we know that we're looking for some side of some sort of issue on the client side. Um, so yeah, just to cover what the functionality was, um, you could like type a note and it'll make you like, it'll send you a URL. And if you go to that URL, it'll have like your note there. So it's like a classic paste bin type challenge. And um, so if we look at the source code of the challenge, uh, we'll see that your, um, your content, which is in the in memory map called notes is retrieved with dot get and um, it's put into the page. But, um, you know, like, does anyone want to take a guess at what's wrong with this sort of, this sort of behavior? Um, like, what is wrong with this um, implementation here? Uh, 
Uh, does anybody want to take a stab? Anyone in the Zoom chat want to take a stab? No. Okay, this is a little sad. It's okay. Um, essentially, the issue is that we're creating um, HTML in a string and re returning that to the client when they make a request to slash view slash ID. But we're also templating into that without any mutation to our input. So like, because our raw input is, is passed directly back to the client, um, we can put markup in our, in our um, text as well. And since we have like the strong tags around it, it's bolded in our output. Does why that happens make sense to people? Okay, cool. Um, uh, the issue is like, we could try running JavaScript, but it doesn't work. Um, that image is not the right image. But if we look here, we can try putting like script alert one as our input to the, to the note creation. And even though it gets put into the page, we see that we don't see an alert box pop up. And that's because we have something called a content security policy. And um, this is a header that we set on all of our, all of our um, responses that tells the client, um, if you see a script, only run it if it's at a URL that um, this same web page is serving. Um, does that kind of make sense to people? So um, like one question you might have is like, well, we have scripts here that are, that are working and this script does not run at all. And why is that? Well, it's because these scripts are served at slash config, config and slash script. And our content security policy says that our source of scripts must be self. So inline scripts are not allowed. Okay. And yeah, so another interesting like feature that we might wanna look at in this, in this, um, in this app is like the previous note functionality. So once you create two notes, uh, you'll see that there's like a URL where you can click it and view a previous note. And to see how that works, we can just look at script.js um, that, that is on the client. And um, uh, yeah, here's how that works. So first we take um, the previous URL out of local storage, and then we get the current one by taking the location of, our, of, our, uh, of, of the current like URL. And then you put the, um, you put the previous URL into uh, an anchor tag on the page, and then you set previous and local storage to current. And um, does anyone want to like comment on like what local storage is? Do people know what that does? Okay, local storage is basically like um, like your cookies, right? But except um, cookies are sent with every request you make from a web page, but local storage is not. Um, that basically allows you to store a little bit of information um, between uh, like sessions for a user. Um, so this basically puts it into your browser's uh, like data. So when you visit the page again, you can see the content. You even see the content of it. Um, and then finally, we have some like fetch thing going on. And like, it seems to be making a request to some config.analytics endpoint with the content of the previous and current, um, I guess, uh, notes. Uh, and we see, if we look in the console or in the developer tools under the request section, we can see the request that is made when we visit the page. I sent it to this URL, like newrelic.com, which is a logging service. Um, this is not a real API key. I just like made one up to make it like semi-realistic. Um, but we see that it sends the current and previous URLs to that endpoint. And because we know that the, um, the note that we're trying to look for, the flag that we want is in the note of the, um, I guess, admin or the person who's visiting our site, we want to try to find out what their previous note was. Um, and that's clear if you just like read the source code. I probably should have put an image of that here. But um, if we can control where these analytics are sent, then we can just get the uh, URL to where the flag is and we can see the flag. Um, yeah, so the main idea here is to use something called DOM clobbering. And just for context, Back um, like before the current state of JavaScript and the web, um, people would like have web pages in HTML and they would want to add JavaScript to reference elements of the, of the um, document. Um, the elements in the document are put in something called like a document object model, it's just like a big tree of all your elements. And um, before our current APIs for, 
for, for accessing those. Um, there were like a lot of shortcuts that people would use to um, access those elements. And essentially, um, when you put um, something in the ID of an element, you can actually get that element um, in JavaScript just by referencing that ID as if it's the identifier. So if you um, put this into a web page and then evaluate the JavaScript AAAA, it would return um, an object that is that anchor element on the page. And normally, like this is not that useful, and this is not something that you should be doing in actual web applications because it's not a great API, and also, like it's just not a not a good idea. But um, this is very useful for us because although we can't run our own JavaScript on the page, we can borrow the JavaScript that exists and make it do what we want it to do. Um, and yeah, you can see that another uh, interesting feature is if you have two things with the same ID but different names, then they will be uh, those names will be like under properties of the original identifier. Um, and yeah, so here we put two anchor tags into the page with these two hrefs, example dot one, example dot two. But um, you will notice that only the second one like seems to be correct. Does anyone know why the first one? says like the, the wrong URL. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so they uh, for the Zoom people, the answer was like some element like that exists on the page. And that's basically right. If we look back in our JavaScript, we look for an anchor tag on the page and set the href on it. And um, we haven't, and because this stuff is before the actual anchor tab for the previous link, it uses this link. Um, to um, to uh, to put uh, our like previous URL in, so yeah. So here we can kind of like describe a solution outline, or this is just the solution. Um, we first have to make the config object not exist, and this config object you see is not actually in script.js. That's because it's set in a different uh, file called uh, like config.js. But um, does anyone know like how we could make it so once script.js is run, we don't actually see the config? No. Okay. Um, the idea is, even though we can't put our own inline scripts in, we can still embed these scripts into the page, and it'll still run them. So if we put script.js in ourselves, it um, won't have the config object until the config one is run. So here in our payload, we can just include the script.js ourselves and not have the config.js script in front of it. And then config as an object won't actually exist when it runs the fetch. Does that make sense to people? Okay, yeah. And then the next step is we have to like clobber the um, actual uh, configuration things, right? So we want to set ID, oh, sorry, we want to set config.analytics to our own endpoint. And we want to set config.key to something random just to make it so everything like works and doesn't error. Um, and here I'm using a service called like webhook.site. This essentially lets you, uh, it gives you an endpoint that you can make requests to and it'll show you the responses. And like, if it's possible, I can do a quick demo on this computer. Uh, how do I do that? Oh, I see. I want to keep screen sharing though, right? Yeah. Strong. Okay. So if I if I remember right, the challenge is uh can I clip this mic on my phone? That's uh yeah, go to Notes. Oh, so smart. That Charles. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Here I can show that if you do, if you try to do a. Oh gosh. Do an alert like like this. It's not going to work. Um. I hope it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't work. And if we look in the developer tools, uh, 
we see this error. It essentially just says that um, because of our CSP, we aren't able to execute that inline script. So um, yeah, we can use a service to kind of like receive requests. And just to show how this works, let's um, copy the URL it gives us and just like visit it. And then it um, receives it. And this tells us some information. It tells us where it's from. It gives us any like query strings. It gives us uh, all the information about the headers and stuff. And if there's any content, like it's a post request, it'll give us the content. Uh, yeah. So essentially what we want to do is we want to have this. Oh, it's view only now. That's so sad. Um, we'll just copy this. Just to walk through what this does, uh, what's the purpose of this first like anchor element? Oh, am I? Uh, oh, you're so right. Um, is there like, no, you can't see it because you can't do new lines in the, uh, in the input. Um, Uh, I hope people can see this now, but um, so well, like, do people want to say what the purpose of this first uh, anchor is? It's to solve the issue from before, right? Where because we had this anchor on the page, the JavaScript was overwriting the actual content of it and setting it to the wrong URL. We want it to be our own. So we have to add a, like an empty one here so that it doesn't like mess it up. And then we want to use um, like this URL here. I think everything else should be fine. Of course, this key doesn't matter. It's just put at the end of the request, but we just need to set it uh, just in case that there are like issues. And then um, if we do make this as a note, uh, we, we do see a post request come in the second we visit it. And it says that and it gives our previous and current like URLs, right? And also if we like notice that this is something that is part of like this page, or if I reload this page, it'll make a request to every single time. And that's because there's JavaScript now in the page that because we have overwritten what config dot like analytics is, it'll um, send the supposed analytics to our endpoint. And now we can just like submit this to the simulated like client. So. This right. Oh, so good at guessing. Okay, yeah, and then we just like, hopefully we just put it in here. Um, please. Wait, did I just get something? Oh, okay. So we see that it visited it, so we got a new request, and we see that the IP is from like some, some um, IPv, like six, which makes sense because we have some like. like Kubernetes thing or something. It's Google, yeah. And then uh, we can look at the previous URL. Uh, and that just like has our flag in it. Yeah. Um, are there questions about this challenge, about like the general approach to it, anything like that? Okay, cool. Um, are there other challenges that, is that the last one that we have slides for? Yeah, are there other challenges that people want to go through? Like maybe other web, maybe some crypto, anything like that? Ah, uh, password three. Okay. For password three, I'll give like a high level overview of how to do it because I don't have a cell script on, on hand right now, but. It's fine, doesn't matter. I the thing. We have priority right now, so it's okay. Okay. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, to be honest, the solution to that challenge was like completely unintended. Uh, it was supposed to be like way harder, but 
Um, I, I forgot that I, I have no critical thinking skills. So. Um, yeah, this is password three. Um, if you read the source code, which I don't have on hand, you'll see that it's like, I think SQLI. And um, the idea is like, if you uh, like do something like this, it'll tell you that like you've gotten in, but you haven't like actually read the flag. And the main trick here is to, wait. The main trick here is to realize that um, initially it might seem like there's no way to get the flag out of this because it's not actually like printing anything after a query. There might be a case where you have a search, a search engine that takes in a query and then gives you results. And there you might be able to concat with some, with some other table and, and get it to print out all tables and you can see a lot of results there. But here we actually don't seem to have any outputs. Um, I guess it's not actually true because there is one piece of output that we do have and it's uh, whether the login was, was successful. So like in each, in each query, we actually get a bit of, of, um, of information about like what's going on. So, um, so if I'm guessing what the SQLI looks like, and if you're solving this, you don't actually have to do that. Um, I just don't remember what the challenge is, but I assume that it looks something like, um, Maybe some table, I don't know. And then like something. And um, yeah, so here, what we were doing before is when we do, when we, when we do our first payload, what happens is it turns this into um, this other query here. Um, and that's why we can log in with this because it's asking, is there a row in our table such that the password column is an empty string or some true statement? And obviously this is true for every single row in the table because true is always true. Uh, which is what, which is why we get the, um, the output there. But here we can also do some other tricks because um, in SQL we actually have um, like, so you can do something like this or like, or, or oops, I have to do or password like. And at this point, it actually like is a bit concerning because I need to know what the column is. Um, but I can figure that out if I don't know. Um, we can try this. If that's not right, I'm gonna go have, I'm gonna go look at the source code. Okay, yeah, so let's just in. Um, so that tells us that the column is actually password. Again, you don't have to guess this during the, during the actual like competition. It's in the source code. I just don't have it right now. Um, so what can we do now? Does anyone have ideas for how we can try to get the flag out? Yeah, Amar. Yeah, brute force. But of course we can't do a typical brute force, right? Because yeah, Mars says brute force one character at a time. So this actually gives us like a sort of oracle for understanding whether a given character is right, right? A given substring is right. So let's say we do this. What is this query asking? Does someone wanna 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 like read that in like normal English? Yeah, exactly. So this is asking, is there some row in our table where the password column is F and then some characters? And um, ideally this should be true. Hmm? My bad. Oh, you're so smart. Okay, yeah. Um, is there no animation for, for it being wrong? It should shake, right? Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, I uh, should not have done that. Okay, we're, we're chilling. And that says that like we got it right. Um, so suppose we didn't know this first character. How many tries would it take for us to figure out what the first character is? Yeah, I'm hearing like numbers that are like around like 50 or like 100 or so, and that's about right. Because like, there's only a limited set of characters that the flag can be. And um, does someone want to like take a stab at why brute forcing a character at a time is different from brute forcing the entire thing? 
Like, why is it feasible to solve this challenge if we have something that tells us if a substring is right, but it's not feasible to just guess a flag about it? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I heard multiple people say it's like multiplication versus like addition, where if we if we want to guess the whole flag, we need to guess every single character right to get any information. But in this case, we can just guess one character at a time. So if the flag is like even like like a thousand a thousand um, bytes long, we know that each byte is between, between zero and two fifty five. That'll only take like two hundred fifty two hundred thousand requests, which is like pretty bad, but not that bad. If we had to guess all 1,000 characters at a time, it would be completely prohibitive. That's like 255 to the 1,000, right? I don't know. I'm pretty bad at math, but I assume that's math. Um, so I don't have time to like really write a full script for getting the, the flag out of this, but I hope that this gives an outline of how you can do it. The next step here would be to like try to guess the next character. You might guess A and like see if it does anything. And it'll say like it's wrong, so we know it's not A. You can try like B, it'll say it's wrong. And once you get to L, it'll say that, like, you can log in, which tells you that L is correct. Um, does that make sense to people, like, how to solve this challenge? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, in Python, the request library is, like, very nice. Um, it's, like, pretty ergonomic. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah, uh, if, if I were doing this challenge, I would just solve it with, like, Python. This is probably already installed on everyone's, well, on most people's computers already. But um, you can just make, make requests like this. It's very nice. Um, and I would encourage people who didn't solve this challenge to try to solve it and like work through writing a script to do this because this technique is fairly common in CTF and also in the real world. Um, uh, there are some analogous things uh, with leaking information across different web pages that um, use similar techniques. So. I guess we have five minutes. Are there any challenges that people really want to see? Or maybe I can have Spencer go over some rev. Anyone? Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah. Joe, do you want to do that one? Or I saw some discourse about it, but I didn't like it. Sure. Oh, can you hold it? Thanks. Nice. Like Steven. Steven? Makes sense. He's not mad at you. He's like, he wanted to do it. Maybe he just forgot about it. What is it? I pass it. I have to, I think. Isn't this like the first one? Wait, do we know who this is? Is this this is not Tulsa, right? This is the, this is the... If anyone asks about Oxdocs, here's a write-up. Yeah, so Tilson, I think who created Oxdocs, posted a write-up about it, uh, which you can look on. Huh? This is not Tilson. This is just someone who did a good write-up, and it was basically the same thing as he would have wrote. Yeah, so Tilson thought this was a really good write-up and wanted to share it. Um, yeah, I'd suggest reading it. I'm not super familiar on the challenge, but oh, you 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 can show Tilson's like thing. Tilson has a thing for. I don't want to show Tilson's thing. I don't know what we're talking. Okay, I'll just give the main idea. Um, here's the challenge.
Oh yeah, this is pretty neat. It has to know your location, you allow it. And then it says the distance that these meshes are sent at. And I think the main idea is that you just like try to triangulate where um, it's coming oh. from. So um, if you look at the request here, to be honest, I haven't looked at this, but I assume this is what's going on. If we look at the request, we see that um, we have a get post endpoint and we're sending our own location. And then it responds with a distance. So that means that if we sample enough places, we can um, we have a um, constraint on where the lo location can, location can be, and if you do that enough times, you can just like just figure out where it is. So here, oh, you want to explain? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I think he was kidding. Yeah, you can you can go for it more. Wait, I don't think this, this this doesn't work for the Zoom though, uh -huh. um, which is a little tough. You can go over go over it if you don't need your own laptop for it. Uh, do you want to like go over it if you don't need your own laptop for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can quickly cover it. Unless you want to screen share. No, no. Um, I mean, I could also do this. Should? Okay. Um, yeah, there is. So, as they mentioned, this is an instance of the more general problem of multilaterations. Do you do you have a um, marker, like an expo marker? Okay. Um, I guess I can try pulling up one note. Huh? Oh no, paint. <laughs> oh God. Paint. All right. Um, so this is an instance of the general problem of multilateration. In general, you have a bunch of circles uh, and a set of base stations, if you will, um, where these circles are centered and they, you have some overlaps between them. They might not be perfect. Uh, you might get instances where they don't necessarily agree. Uh, the problem then is to try and find a good estimate uh, of the true location given these base stations. Um, the problem is a bit weird in the sense that it takes in a latitude and a longitude. Uh, most formulations of this multilateration problem, they take a vector in R3, um, but you can convert it uh, quite easily as long as you know the radius of the Earth. Uh, it turns out when I was writing up my solution that I got the radius of the Earth wrong. Um, don't do that. Um, yeah. The idea for a good first solution is suppose we have a couple of base stations, let's say right here and right here. They will have some, we, we have some ranging information for these circles. Um, let's say this one is over here, and then this one is, okay, I am something like this. We know then that the true solution is going to lie on this, uh, this plane that goes through the, the two intersection points of the circle. And this works in three dimensions as well. The only difference is now you have two spheres that will intersect at a circle. Still, a circle is a planar shape. You can find the plane that goes through it. Specifically, if we have, um, let's see if I can get my pencil out. If we have that, uh, if we have the true location as x, we have x minus x1 squared, and this sums over all the coordinates, is equal to the distance from base station one squared. Um, and then we have this for the second base station as well. We subtract the first equation from the second to obtain a linear equation in terms of, um, in terms of just the base stations. So it gives this, uh, this plane here. We do this for all pairs of base stations. We get a system of linear equations. We solve that and get the, uh, get the location from there. I know I'm sort of glossing over the algebra a bit, but um, that's that's the main idea. Any questions? Okay. 
Um, however, in some cases, this isn't necessarily accurate enough. Uh, there is a second technique that you can use once you have an estimate for the solution. How many of you have taken calculus? I think it's a required course. Yeah. You remember, uh, how many of you have used Newton's method for finding the roots of something? Okay. I mean, I'll go over that because it's generally a good technique to know. So suppose we have some, uh, some function. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, but I would like to find the roots of this function. And let's say I have a particular point here. Suppose further that the function is differentiable, which means near a point, it looks linear. Um, so we can draw the tangent line over here uh, to this function. Now, the function won't exactly be that tangent line, but it's close enough. Um, and especially as the distance gets very small, it'll approximate the tangent line better and better. Now, we know how to find the roots of this linear equation. We've been solving linear equations ever since like algebra one or something. So we find the roots of that, the one root of that. Um, and we say that that might be a solution of our original function. It may not be, um, but chances are it'll be closer to the root of the original function. So we do this process again. We take this new guess for a root, draw the tangent line, take the new point, take that as a new guess, and then keep repeating and keep repeating. And you can see them converging very quickly on the root. Um, this method works in general. So suppose I have, um, suppose I have some error function that takes in, let's say a point in space, and returns how far it is from the base stations um, compared to what it is actually expected to be. So if I had a point that's like here and I had base stations here and here, and I expect the distances to be, I don't know, like five and three or something like that. Um, the distance might be like six and five or whatever. I write this down. So the current distance is like six and five. Expected distances are five and three. This gives a deviation of one and two. And we like to try and minimize this deviation. We want to get as close to the true solution as possible. Um, so we do the same thing. We take the, the analog of the derivative. It's called the Jacobian. You probably know this if you took Calc 3. Um, and then we do this iteration. Uh, and this will eventually minimize the function that we're trying to minimize. Any questions on Newton's method? Generally, it's a good trick to have. It's a good. Um, numerical approximation, just like binary search uh, in the one-dimensional case. All right. Yeah, and um, it turns out with these methods, even if you get the radius of the Earth wrong, you can get close enough um, to get the flag. <laughs> um, I think I was off by like 50, 50 million kilometers, uh, no. That, that's a lot of kilometers. Um, I was probably off by like 50 kilometers, I think, um, in terms of the radius, which doesn't sound like a lot, but especially when you're close. Um, although in this case, gradient descent does work, especially if you're close to the point and you can approximate the Earth is flat. Uh, of course, we all know the Earth is globally flat. Um, but even if you assert that the Earth is locally flat, we get um, that the point that minimizes the distance um, or the function that takes in a point and returns the, dif the distance, that function is convex. It decreases strictly, and uh, it only has one minimum at the actual point. Um, so if you could somehow obtain gradient information, you can just gradient descent all the way down to that point, and then you're done. Um, I don't know how Neil actually got the gradient information, or if he even did. I don't know.
Okay, thanks everyone again for coming. Um, we're gonna end it there. Make sure to do attendance if you didn't do that yet. Uh, I'm just gonna leave that up and we still have snacks. We still have drinks. So 